All right, this video is for the inference for regression lines, and I'm going to try to make this pretty simple because it is kind of like the last lesson we're learning here, and I don't want to overcomplicate things. But the good news is by going over this lesson, we'll also be reviewing regression lines, which is pretty important as well. So let's make sure we understand the basics of a regression line, so that way we can truly understand re inference for those regression lines. Here's the problem we're going to use for this video. Having graded a test, a teacher was interested in the relationship between the amount of time the students studied for the test and the scores they received. She asked 24 students individually how much they studied and then compiled a list giving for each student the amount of time studied and the score on the test. The teacher performed a least squares regression analysis. Part of the computer output from that analysis is shown below. So let's make sure we remember what these computer output tables show us first. Next to the word constant is always the y-intercept. So that word constant is always the y-intercept. Directly underneath that is the slope. So 69.55 is the y-intercept. Directly underneath that is the slope. And when you also look here, this the word right here underneath the word concept is your x variable. So basically we're trying to see, does the time it takes you to take a test directly change your test score, right? Is there a connection, right? Is there a relationship? And let me just make a couple observations here. First off, the slope is positive, which means that there is a positive relationship. So if you study longer, you will do better on the test. And... I do want to make a couple more observations. The R squared is pretty low, which means it's not the strongest connection in the world. So it might be positive, but the dots might not form this real tight, straight, perfect line. And that's okay. I mean, you know, we our data is what our data is. Nothing we could do about it. All right, so our equation of our line came back with y hat, which is the predicted score, equals the 69.56. I'll just round the two decimals there plus 0.26 times x, where x, x is the time that you actually studied on the test. So that's what this equation is used for. You tell me how much time you studied for the test, I'll plug it into this equation with your y-intercept 69.56 plus your slope times x, and I will predict for you what your score is. But again, because that r squared is not really good, um, you know, this might not be the best prediction out there in the world. But what I really want to get to is the inference. What you need to understand is that this was a sample conducted on only 24 students, right? This slope, the slope we got of 0.26 was just the slope we got from one sample. And if we have learned anything in the last couple of months about sampling, is that if we were to do this with another 24 kids, we might get a different slope. Another 24 kids, another slope. This slope of 0.26 is only for these 24 kids. If I looked at another sample, I could get another slope. So the question is twofold. The first question is, well, what's the true slope, right? And we're going to use the Greek letter beta to represent the true slope, right? What is the slope, not for just these 24 kids or even another group of 24 kids, but what's the true slope between the time spent on a test and the test score for all students, for the entire population, right? So I'll to understand it's just like sampling right we're looking for the true mean and we use our sample mean to estimate it we're looking for the true proportion and we're looking for a sample proportion to estimate it. it's the exact same concept we're looking for that true slope and we're going to use one particular sample slope to estimate it so now the question becomes can we create a confidence interval for the true slope and it is absolutely so simple remember the idea the basic idea for a a confidence interval is this, right? It's an observation, something you saw, right? An observation from a sample. So it's an observation from a sample plus or minus a margin of error. And that margin of error is again a T star times your standard error, right? So let's watch how easy this could be made into a confidence interval. So here's the idea. We saw an observed slope of 0.26. That was the slope that we observed. But listen, that was just one group of 24 kids. The true slope could be a little higher or a little bit lower. So we're going to go up and go down by a margin of error. Now, how do we get that margin of error? Well, the first thing we need is a T-star, and that's based on your level of confidence. So let's just use a typical 95% confident. So to get the T-star for 95% confident, I am going to go to invert T. 95% confident puts 0.025 on the bottom tail. That's that bottom 2.5% to find the T star. And I do need degrees of freedom. Now, traditionally degrees of freedom is sample size minus 1. <laughs> Sorry for the cough. So somebody might say, oh, 23 degrees of freedom. 
Um, but what we're going to do here is we're actually going to subtract two because we have two variables here. We don't just have one variable. We have time and we have the test score. So we're actually going to subtract two. So we're going to get 22 degrees of freedom. And you only do this weird subtraction of two when you're working with scatter plots and regression because, again, it makes sense there are two variables. So I'm going to take 24 minus 2 and get 22 degrees of freedom. So my T star with 22 degrees of freedom and 95% confident is 2.0. 074. And I got that using my T84 calculator. You could also get that if you want to using a T chart as well. Now, next comes the standard error. And this is the best part. I'm not going to lie to you. The formula for standard error when working with slope is a little bit more complicated. We know the formula for standard error for the proportions. We know the formula for standard error for means. Slope is a little bit weird, but you don't even have to worry about it. Look right here. The standard error is given to you in this computer output. It is right next to the slope. So here's the slope of 0.26. Right next to it is our standard error. I'm going to use three decimals, 0.109. So that is our standard error. So now it's so easy to calculate the margin of error, 2.074 times 0.109, and I get a margin of error of 0.226. So we get 0.26, that was our observed slope, plus or minus the margin of error, 0.226. Now I can go up and I can go down, so 0.26 minus 0.226, 0.034. And 0.26 plus 0.226, lots of 226s there, so be careful. And I get 0.486. So here's the idea, right? I'm 95% confident that the true slope between how long you study on a test and your test score is somewhere between 0.034 and 0.486. Now, an important thing I want to note is that zero is in this interval. Which means, I'm sorry, oh wow, did I say that wrong? Zero is not in this interval, which means that there is a positive slope, right? So I don't know exactly what that slope is, but I'm admitting that it, it, it is a positive slope, right? It could be a very, very little change between your test score and how many hours you study, or there could be a significant change with the slope of 0.486, but there is going to be a change, right? Your time that you spend studying on a test does have some connection to your test score. Now, let's just say that zero was in the interval. Like, let's just kind of pretend here for a second. Let's just say that zero was in this interval. So let's just say the interval went from a negative to a positive, meaning that it did contain somewhere in there, it did contain the number zero. Now, if zero is in your interval, then that means that there could be no slope. And if there could be no slope, there, if there are a slope of zero, that means that there is absolutely no connection between your two variables, right? So the time you spend studying on a test has little or nothing to do with the actual test score. So when you see a zero in your interval, that tells you that there, you know, maybe you did see a slope, but because your interval contains zero, you know what? There is probably no true connection between these two variables. Again, sorry for the cough. So that's kind of a really simplistic idea of what's happening here, and I hope that this all makes complete sense. And again, it's the same idea as a confidence interval, right? We take our observed value, which for us was a slope, we go up and we go down by a margin of error. And it's that simple, right? You just have to make sure you understand the ideas of a regression line to begin with. This is the whole idea that our particular data came up with a slope of 0.26. But listen, that's just one sample. There are many other samples just like ours out there. What would the true slope of all of those samples be? And that's what we're looking for when I say beta over here. So the idea is we simply took our slope 0.26, we went up and we went down by a margin of error to try to estimate what the true slope could be for all samples, not just ours. And to end, because our